So I was asked to talk about immune changes and chronic fatigue markers, and also as I go along to um, show how they uh, might describe a, what, what might happen in a chronic viral condition. So I tried to set it up that way. Um, in this course of this talk, I'm putting my thank yous up first because I always run out of time and it's rude to not thank your collaborators. But much of what I'll be talking about today is Dr. Mary Ann Fletcher's work. She's right there, so you can ask her. No, <laughs> seriously. We'll be talking about a lot of the immune stuff. We've had a long history in our laboratory of doing a lot of immunologic work, and Dr. Fletcher has been the, the uh, key player through all of that. We have a lot of other wonderful um, colleagues and investigators. Suzanne Vernon's here today. It's a, it's a good group. And through many years of work, we've collected a lot of samples, which is good. You've heard a lot about the, um, this sort of construct. I think that Andrew put this in his uh, side set, that there might be a genetic predisposition triggering and so on. Today I'm talking about the immune thing, but I really want to say there's a lot of interaction that we're not talking about between the immune, the neuroendocrine, and the autonomic nervous system. And sometimes things are not as simple, as complicated as this all seems, and they're not as simple as uh, we might be presenting here. Um, jump here. When we look at caseness with chronic fatigue syndrome, you've talked, and, and I think that Peter said this, that there's an umbrella case definition with a lot of symptoms in there. And there's more than one way to get that way. And this conference is very focused on the subgroup that might be suffering from viral reactivation. How big or small that subgroup is is yet to be defined, but we've heard numbers as small as, say, 17 percent and as big as, say, 82 percent in this conference. So uh, there's a lot of, of room there to argue about how big it is. But in, remember that these are overlapping, and uh, the immune, the autonomic, and the uh, neuroendocrine are overlapping. So the immune system. First, a little primer. I apologize to all you immunologists to be too simplistic. <laughs> but you know, you don't really want to hear the whole thing. <laughs> it's almost lunchtime. But let's just start with the easy thing. Usually when there's an infection in the system, uh, first off, when the immune system's working too hard, when it's activated, it's usually antigen driven. There's only so many ways you can overactivate an immune system. And the, the pathognomonic thing in chronic fatigue syndrome is this overactivated immune system. So we talk about, in basic immunology, the immune system's antigen driven. Look for the antigen when you have an activated system. There's so many, so many things that can activate and drive a system. A pathogen, or more than one pathogen. An allergen, you heard yesterday about super antigens, another possibility. And more recently, there's some other little clues going out there about sympathetic nervous system activation of the immune system. So there's a different thing that we don't hear about too much. And of course, the other thing we're not speaking about, autoimmunity. So there, how many different ways might you turn on the on button and leave it pushed on? Well, maybe five different ways. And that's what the clues have here. So we start with this cell, this macrophage. The macrophage usually presents the foreign antigen to the immune system, or even the autoantigen. It presents it to the T cells, T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells, and so on. And the T helper cells go about dividing and cloning out and making the armies of memory cells and effector cells that are going to deal with this infection. So, so we have this cascade of things, the macrophage, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, and so on. Now there's a divergence there. There's a cytotoxic T cell that would go after more of the types of infections that happen within a cell, viral infections, like the herpes family viruses. And then there's uh, the types of things you want to see when you have a bacterial infection, particularly the big bad bugs like uh, pneumococcal or so on, when you really go after an antibody response. And then uh, you are really driving the B cells more and you're, of course, you're pushing that level. So a cytotoxic T cell here is, a t is, is attacking this Epstein-Barr virus infected cell and it's going to basically go up to the cell and shoot little pores, little, little tubes into the cell and shove a bunch of enzymes into the cell that will destroy it and kill the virus in that cell. So the perforins make these tubes and the granzymes kick across into there and, and you know, this cell that self-destructs, leaving a perfectly intact cytotoxic T cell to go off and kill another cell somewhere. Same thing happens with natural killer cells. Could be the same picture. So, ah, oh geez, I hate the way that Mac is screwing up the words thing. That's too bad. We're going to skip that slide. Let me tell you what the slide was going to say. <laughs> it looked perfect on their screen back there. Um, 
Basically, and again, a little oversimplified, there's type 1 and type 2 cytokines. Type 1 cytokines, you've heard a bit about today, um, interferon alpha, IL, IL2, they go down the cytotoxic T cell pathway and promote that type of cell to do their job. And type 2 cytokines are the ones that promote B cells to be more effective and efficient in their job. Very frequently, type 2 cytokines will downregulate type 1 and vice versa, a little seesaw. So you can drive a system into hyperdrive in one system or the other. So to give you a different example away from our field, in HIV, when a person's got a CD4 count that's pretty normal, they're dealing with the infection, they're doing pretty well with it, they have a type 1 cytokine expression. When they shift to this type 2 through a series of things that happen to them, suddenly they get a much more rapid progression of their disease. So there's been a lot of, of, of focus in chronic fatigue syndrome with the herpes family virus worries that there, we should worry about type 1, type 2 and wonder if there might be an overdrive. And there's been a number of papers, including our own, that suggest there is, in the chronic phase of this illness, a type 1 um, drive. You heard today Andrew Lloyd and, and, and uh, his group talking about maybe a type 1 initial response but with uh, polymorphisms that are different. And that was very interesting. Is there something wrong about that initial type 1 cytokine response? or something too extreme or something that drives and triggers another series of downstream events to move things into chronicity. I thought that was fascinating and raises a lot of very interesting questions. So the immune abnormalities seen in chronic fatigue syndrome are characterized on this slide and there, there are many cross-sectional studies but there are also many longitudinal studies now to go back to and look at these things. And you see a host of studies that um, document immune activation through a number of pathways. Uh, flow cytometric uh, studies of T cell activation when you tag a lymphocyte with not just the, cell, the identifier of the cell type, but also the kinds of receptors it would express where it activated and what they do, which is interesting. The types of cytokine patterns that, um, that happen and this type 2 shifting in, in chronic fatigue syndrome that we've dem demonstrated and other groups talk about. Some that have said no, some say yes. Uh, Pro-inflammatory cytokine cascades. This is often misstated in conferences. Um, anything that overdrives a system can turn on the pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade. It's not a type 1 or a type 2 specific phenomena. Rather, it's a system that's turned on. And this TNF, IL-1, IL-6, you've heard a lot about that over the last couple of days, um, is turned on in the sickest group of chronic fatigue patients. Apoptosis is when a cell has been on so long it's been driven into cell death. If you push the on button so long that, and you don't release it, a cell will apoptose. And uh, that's been shown in many different cell lines, including T cells and neutrophils. Functional defects that we've shown and others have shown, natural killer cell dysfunction, cytotoxic T cell abnormalities, the perforin and granzyme stuff I'm going to show you in a moment, and then macrophage and antibody production abnormalities. We don't talk enough about macrophages or antibody or neutrophils, and yet they're very important in sustaining uh, long-term inflammatory responses. Uh, it's just uh, work is still to be done, hasn't been done yet. Now, does it really matter all this immune stuff we talk about? Well, this is some early work from ours. This is cognitive difficulty scales, and when people have fairly normal T cell function, this is a PHA assay where you do the function of cell in vitro in the, in the test tube. Um, when they have fairly normal T cell function, they have fairly normal cognitive scales. But when they have very poor T cell function, they have much worse cognitive scales. We've shown natural killer cell function to be different in chronic fatigue syndrome and significantly different. We think this is a useful biomarker and certainly one that circles an important group in chronic fatigue syndrome, though it's a tedious assay and sometimes it doesn't travel well, so it's got some issues. This is